Mehdi? Is that on? All right, cool. Um, so um, at the end of 2013, the busiest airport in the world, uh, Dubai Airport, decided to install 12 so-called smart gates. The effect was that from a, from a passenger's perspective, uh, there was a huge increase in um, convenience, in efficiency, and speed. From an airport's perspective, there was a huge increase in, again, efficiency, also security, and also cost saving. The effect was that um, in 2014, the airport now decided to upgrade from 12 such uh, smart gates to 102 smart gates. And, well, you guessed it right. Um, the thing which makes all those smart gates and the systems in the background work are APIs in some shape or form. So today I would like to talk about uh, the changing phase of transport via APIs. As Mehdi said, uh, my name is Manfred. I work for Threescale, and we are doing API management. So that means we make it very simple for companies which expose their assets, data, services via APIs to stay in full control and visibility of those APIs. So that's three scale. And as a little um, side project, I'm also running uh, the API magazine, which is an online magazine. Uh, it's free. It's just my own little um, spare time project. And I collect and curate and comment all sorts of articles um, about APIs. So have a look if you're interested in that. So today I would like to cover um, first a, a bit more background about um, opportunities and challenges in the uh, transport sector. Then I would like to summarize five typical API use cases which we, which we see or which we saw over time, together with some examples out of uh, transport industry. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about uh, API economics and in particular um, platform economics because we also have that in the, the headline of the conference. And then finally, I'll give a wrap up and a couple of takeaways. So when we talk about the opportunities of the transport industry, uh, travel industry contributed uh, 6.9 trillion to the global GDP dollars. Uh, to put this into perspective, that's about double the GDP of, of Germany last year. Furthermore, the transport industry accounts for 4.5% of the total global uh, employment, and that's growing. International trade uh, growth forecast is 8%, which is by far more than the, the global GDP growth forecast. We can see a lot of um, signals and signs about um, a growing hyperconnectivity. So in the future, um, people will be connected, places will be connected, machines will be connected, or, or, or things, however you want to call it. Um, and then, to be a little bit more concrete, there are studies out there saying that smart navigation systems would reduce the travel time by up to 18%, um, with all its consequences, like um, saving time, uh, saving, uh, or having less emissions, and saving costs, for example. So these are the opportunities. Some of the challenges. Uh, traffic congestion, the, the effect of traffic congestion reduced the, the GDP of Europe and US last year by $200 billion. Or in other words, if we managed to find better solution for, for traffic congestions, we could increase the GDP by $200 billion. Uh, transport accounts for one fourth of all uh, European emissions. 71% of European car drivers say that um, they don't like the inconvenience of public transport, uh, or in other words, if public transport would be more convenient uh, in various different aspects, more car drivers would actually choose to use public transport. We currently face some sort of saturation of the European skies, um, and this situation is going to be even more severe in the future, as we're expecting uh, the traffic, the, the freight traffic, to increase by 125%. And with all those growth rates, we actually have to ask ourselves, um, where do we get all the energy from to suffice uh, all, all this growth? Right, the solution to all this, you guessed it right, application programming interfaces. Uh, well, this is a bit of a bold statement, and of course I'm uh, exaggerating, but I'm sure there are a lot of um, areas and, and places where APIs can surely uh, help to, to overcome those challenges in, in transport. Um, because APIs, as you all know, are those interfaces which make systems in the background uh, interact with each other in a more efficient way um, and frictionless, if we design them right. Okay, um, so we identified over time uh, some of the very typical API use cases. Uh, we summarized those five use cases uh, in an ebook. Um, it's called Winning in the API Economy. Uh, it's, of course, a free ebook, and if you're interested in, in the background, because I'm basically touching more on the 
um, more abstract models. Uh, feel free to download and have a look. Uh, but here are those five use cases. The first one is enabling mobile channels. Uh, so APIs are often used to enable mobile channels. And that ties in very much with what um, Roman said in the morning uh, from Twitter, that one of, the, one of the drivers where we actually talk about APIs so much was actually mobile, to enable mobile channels. The second API use case is growing ecosystems. So that can be seen in, in two aspects. So in a more B2C area, where you try to grow your ecosystem with customers directly, or also in a, in a B2B environment, where you try to, try to grow your ecosystems with partners. The third API use case is increasing reach. Um, so for example, you can only, as an, as an organization, do so much to, to distribute your content if you work with other partners, if you let third parties integrate with your APIs to access your data, you have potentially a much wider reach due to network effects. Uh, APIs are often used to, to power business models. Now, we, we always say that um, the API should support your business model, but in many cases, uh, the API actually is the business model. And a typical example which we're always talking, to, talking about in that area is, is Twilio, because Twilio's business is, is the API. And then finally, la the last uh, API use case is driving innovation. So many organizations understand that although they may be very, very smart, um, most of the smartness is actually outside uh, of the organization. And by opening up uh, data to let people access those uh, uh, data, they can drive innovation. OK, so let's have a look at a couple of examples. Uh, for the first one, enabling mobile channels, um, I found a couple of uh, good examples. The first one is, is Travelline. Travelline is a... Um, a constellation of various different organizations which decided to expose data for uh, multimodal travel planning throughout the UK. And this data has been adopted now by, by several mobile apps um, to use in, in, in the mobile apps. Another project is uh, a European, uh, is a project funded and supported by the European Commission. It's called City SDK. And City SDK also provides a whole raft of different sort of um, open data including as one crucial element, transport data. And that, again, has been adopted by uh, many, many mobile apps uh, already. So that's some examples for the first use case. The second use case is um, growing ecosystems. Um, uh, one good example here is uh, Karma. Karma is a company that um, provides um, a carpooling service. Um, and they, they expose more or less the same functionality, not just uh, as an app or as a service, but also through, through APIs. And by that, they're trying to uh, grow the ecosystem, and we actually have the CTO of, of Karma here in the, uh, here in the uh, audience, and he will talk a little bit more about Karma in the next presentation. Uh, the third use case is increasing reach, um, and a great example here is probably uh, Uber. Uh, I guess most of you uh, know that Uber exp uh, exposed their service as an API, and by that they sort of made this transition from sort of only being a service uh, into a platform, and there is this um, quote I found by Gartner where they say that by allowing other people to, to use Uber functionality as an API, they can be embedded in so many different other application, applications and services, and by that they can increase uh, their sales potential enormously. So that's a classical example for, for increasing reach. The fourth uh, use case is powering uh, business models. Um, there is a company called uh, Transport API. Um, they again provide an aggregation of various transport-related uh, data feeds. Uh, and by the way, Travelline, my first example, is, is part of that as well. Um, and they monetize the API. So they have some sort of um, freemium price model. So at the lowest level, uh, you don't pay anything. But then when you um, go up in your um, consumption, then you would have to, to pay. So they are monetizing their API. And one example which uh, uses uh, the transport API is actually uh, CityMapper. OK, and then finally, an example for the, the fifth uh, API use case is driving innovation. Transport for London uh, is a governmental organization uh, in London. And they have a whole raft of all sorts of dif different data in-house. So they have data about um, bus lines, metro lines, fares, times, traffic jams, speed cameras. They even have uh, electric car charge points and the, the, the famous um, Boris bikes, which are those bikes to rent. And at some point, they decided to, to just let people outside also uh, access this data, and by that, ho hope to spur uh, and drive more innovation. OK, 
So that's all uh, nice and neat, and we identified those those use cases. And and by the way, also maybe um, a, a word of warning: those examples which are, which I just mentioned, they usually they, they don't fall exactly into one category, so they're usually overlaps. But you can sort of find some sort of uh, focus. But what really is the the power of APIs now? APIs enable the creation of platforms. Um, and you are maybe aware of um, this really famous article or blog post by Mark Andreessen, where he talked about the different types of, uh, of platforms. And he also defined a platform. And the crucial thing is here that he says that the power of a platform is that it can be adopted or adapted to, to countless needs and, and niches which the original creator of the platform is, is never able to, to foresee. Um, there's no way to foresee all the different possibilities of a platform. And that's, and that's the benefit of a platform. Now, if we drive this thought a little bit further, um, and this is now not purely restricted to, to the transport industry, that's basically true for all industries or for all organizations, um, and hence also for, for transport, what, what uh, a platform allows us is this notion of two-sided business models, or they're also called uh, asymmetric business models. So what's an asymmetric business model? You have um, two types of sites uh, in that uh, asymmetric business model. The one side here on the left is, is, your, is your home market. That's the primary market. And then on the other hand, you have the so-called victimized market, which is a secondary market, uh, which drives the home market. So these two are strongly uh, connected to each other. And probably a, a great example for an asymmetric business model is, is Google Search. So if I'm a Google user and I would like to, to look up something, this is free for me. So that would be on the left-hand side. That's the, that's the home market. Um, and the way the whole thing is, is paid and financed is done on the, on the right-hand side by the victimized market. So that would be um, advertising organizations who pay to have their advertising um, displayed. So that's, that's the basic idea of an asymmetric business model. Now, and here are a bit of uh, some... Um, uh, concepts how an economist would explain that. Uh, so on the left hand side again we have the home market and on the right hand side we have the victimized market. Um, so this is how an economist would draw that. So we have basically uh, vertically the price, horizontally the quantity and then we have some sort of demand curve and this dictates some sort of uh, price and quantity. And because we have a platform and because the home market and the victimized market are depending on each other and connected through the platform, that influences the victimized market. So again, here we have um, quantity and price, and we have some sort of demand curve, and that would result in, in, uh, in a price and a quantity, P1 and Q1 in that case, uh, and that would dictate the revenue. Now, the interesting thing is, if we change something in the home market, so let's say, for example, we, we lower the price from P1 to P2, or actually even make it free, that means we, we would get um, the, the quantity would be increased to, uh, to Q2. And again, because the whole thing is connected through the platform, that would result in some sort of outward shift of the demand curve. And in the victimized market, we would end up, because of that, uh, by being able to um, sell more stuff at a potentially higher price, which also results into larger revenue. That's the, the red rectangle here. So that's the, that's the theory, that's, that, that's the principles. Um, and if we can actually look at, a, at an example. So if you take Transport for London, for instance. Um, so on the left-hand side, they actually provide the API for free. Um, and what they hope to achieve by that is that this would spur some innov innovations that would create more apps and more services which are using um, data from Transport of London. And then at the end of the day, on the other side, they would be able to, to sell more tickets or more rides. Um, so that clearly shows this interdependence between those two markets. Uh, another example, uh, we can talk about Karma, for instance, uh, and that also works both ways because they are th those two markets are connected. If you look at Karma, uh, and they are selling on that end their uh, carpooling service, and if they do something to, I don't know, sell more by some sort of promotions or um, changing the price or whatever, that would have an influence then of, as well on the other end with the API. Whatever they do here would have an influence on the API and then would increase or decrease depending on what they're doing um, with their API. Okay, and as Mark Andreessen said, a platform is basically can be adapted to countless needs and niches, and that would, ha would mean that we can potentially, on top of that, serve N home and victimized markets. So that's the power of a platform enabled by APIs. 
Okay, and just to, to circle it back to what I said initially with those uh, five typical API use cases, um, all of those five use cases are back, uh, basically possible because they're all based on this idea of a platform. So APIs enable platforms, and those five API use cases work because of, because of the fact that they are based on a platform. Okay, just before I uh, wrap up, um, here is a study I found which I find quite interesting. Uh, it's related to uh, the transport sector. Uh, it's a study done by PricewaterhouseCoopers to do that every year where they um, question um, CEOs globally uh, on an annual basis. They interviewed, I think, around 1,300 uh, CEOs in the uh, transportation area. And basically what they say is their most important area for, for investments and business drivers at the same time are technological advances. In fact, 80% almost about those CEOs see that as the most important area to, to invest in the future. Um, and things they mention is um, digital economy, um, mobile, and uh, social media. So I guess that's, that's quite interesting for, for us uh, API people. Okay, um, to summarize my, my key takeaways. So there is a tremendous opportunity in, in transport. Uh, on the other hand, we see a couple of um, big challenges there, social economic challenges, structural challenges, technical challenges, political challenges. Uh, APIs will probably not solve all of those problems, but they can certainly help, especially when it comes to um, technical integration. They do already play um, a, a substantial role in that area, but I'm sure that will increase. Um, I discussed the five typical API use cases. If you're interested in the background, feel free to, to download our ebook. And then I also talked a little bit about um, the platform economics, uh, which allow uh, those different markets, markets, the home market and the victimized market, operate on top of it. Okay, before I finish up, um, I just wanted to leave you with, with one um, thought. I recently saw this um, really great talk by um, Brent Farron on, on TED. Uh, Brent Farron is uh, like a multi-talent. Um, multi uh, he's uh, an, an engineer, inventor, designer, architect, and he was the, the director of R&D for, for Walt Disney. And he gave this talk on TED, and basically he was talking about uh, the Pantheon, which is an amazing building in, in Rome. Um, and it was built 2,000 years ago, and several different miracles, he called it miracles, happened to make uh, this building possible. And he was asking himself, so what's the Pantheon of our times? And he did a bit of an, an analysis, and basically he said that the next miracle will come out of the transportation area. And I thought this was a really great talk, very inspiring. And if you are in this field of transportation, um, I would really like to encourage you to have a look at that. And with that, I would like to conclude. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. <laughs> are there any questions? Are there people from public transport or car industry or in the room? <laughs> no, no, just I will not ask any question directly if you don't want better. Just to know approximately the, the audience. Uh, yeah? Okay. Does someone has a question now? <laughs> I look at you. <laughs> it's fine. So maybe we can, uh, we can have uh, uh, Eric. Sure. And maybe we'll, yeah, the question on transportation will come. So sure. please, a warm applause from uh, Manfred. Thank you.